a very warm welcome to everybody to this short program on Matthew 16, 21 to 28. The reading for Sunday, 22 in year A. As usual, we'll go straight to the slides. So our gospel is Matthew 16, 21 to 28. The pattern we'll use in the presentation is something on the current context, the place of this text in the gospel overall, a note on the passion predictions, then a reading of Matthew 16, 21 to 28, and then comparing Mark and Matthew, always illuminating, a commentary on the text, and then some pointers for prayer and closing again with a prayer. For the current context, as you can see on the slide, I have two panels. The one on the left is the cost of discipleship today, more or less in general, and the one on the right on a more personal note. We know that in the West today, it is difficult to be a Christian believer, to admit it, and to be able to express the values. Of course, in the West, we are not physically persecuted, but this is certainly the case for our fellow Christians in the Middle East, fellow Christians in China, and fellow Christians in India and Pakistan. And there people really do have to pay the price for being followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, a book has been written called Christianophobia, by Rupert Short, well-known uh, Anglican writer, uh, Faith Under Attack. And his thesis is that as things stand today, Christianity is the most persecuted religion worldwide. On a more personal note, each of us can ask ourselves, of course, am I more a believer or am I really a disciple? And what does it mean to me to be precisely a follower of Jesus, a disciple? That leads then to other questions. When do I pay attention to his teaching? And then if I look back over my own path of discipleship, what have been the major turning points? And it's always good to ask, where do I find myself now as a believer and as a disciple and as a follower of Jesus Christ? To locate the gospel as usual, we're in book four in Matthew's overall scheme, and we're still in part one, the narrative dealing with disciples, Peter and church. So that's really the end of chapter 13 to the end of chapter 17. The previous Sunday, we had the confession of Peter and the response of Jesus, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. And in today's gospel, Jesus goes on to interpret the confession made by Peter. As we shall see, it leads to a quite critical engagement with Peter himself. In the overall gospel pattern in John's gospel, in Matthew's gospel, we're in 1621 to 2034, that's Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. And in 21, 1 to 25, 46, Jesus' action in Jerusalem. So mostly we're in that long section 16 to 20 for the next while. I hope this screen is not too complicated. I want to show that the passion predictions are an important part of the layout and persuasion of Matthew's gospel. And I put there kind of four moments. There's a first passion prediction, our text really, it's Matthew 16, 21 to 28, that's followed by a misunderstanding by Peter, followed by a teaching on discipleship. And then there are other passages on the transfiguration and discipleship on faith. Then there's a second passion prediction in 1722 to 23. That's followed by the mysterious story of the payment of the temple tax and the finding of the coin in the fish's mouth. And that's followed by a whole section in 18135, Life in the Community, and that includes specific teaching on discipleship. There is a third passion prediction, this time in 
chapter 20, verses 17 to 38, a third passion prediction, also followed by a teaching on discipleship. And there is in Matthew's Gospel a fourth passion prediction, 21, 26, 1 to 2, very important for Matthew. It's in Matthew only, with no particular link to teaching on discipleship. So in general, the passion predictions lead to some sort of misunderstanding and some teaching on the nature of true discipleship. A brief note on the passion predictions. Uh, it is likely that the historical Jesus anticipated his destiny, certainly if he had paid attention to the destiny of many of the prophets in the Old Testament. And the passion predictions are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not actually in John's Gospel. And the first person to show this pattern is, of course, Mark's Gospel. And he talks about the suffering of the Son of Man. And that formula, the suffering of the Son of Man, combines Isaiah, the suffering servant, and Daniel, the Son of Man, as an agent of end-time salvation. It's always good to remember that Matthew was written, written after Mark, Mark itself written only some 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And he writes you know, a generation later, in light of the resurrection, of course, and in light of the continued interpretation of Jesus in the light of Scripture. And he produces, Mark that is, produces a pattern, prediction, misunderstanding, and teaching on discipleship. A pattern more or less followed by Matthew, but not so precisely. For many scholars, the passion predictions fall into a category called vaticinium ex eventu, that is, a prophecy made or clarified in light of what actually happened. A prophecy written into the text, looking back after what happened and after some 40 years of reflection. You can see something of this on the next slide, which shows the three passion predictions in Matthew. Working quickly, on the left column, there's a passion prediction in the first box. In the second box down, Peter misunderstands. And in the final box, Jesus gives a teaching on discipleship. Something similar, though not quite identical, happens in the second passion prediction. That's in 17, 22 to 23 in the center column. That's followed not exactly by a misunderstanding, but by a question. At that time, the disciples, came, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And that's followed in the lower column in 18.2 to 5, a teaching on discipleship using the example of a child. The third passion prediction is in chapter 20. And this gives a clear indication of what's going to happen. That's followed by a misunderstanding this time entrusted, I'm afraid, to the mother of the sons of Zebedee, asking for places for her sons at his right and his left. And that's followed by a teaching on discipleship. So, in a word, Matthew picks up on the pattern that Mark created, but doesn't quite follow it with the same strictness. It was there, more or less, all the same. So, with that in mind, we can take a look at the reading itself. I've extended the reading by one verse to include verse 28. It seemed essential to me to be a part of the text. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and experts in the law and be killed and on the third day be raised. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord. This must not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, O Pizumu, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, because you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to become my follower, O Pizumu, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his life? Or what can a person give 
in exchange for his life. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not experience death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It's no harm to make, take note of the comparisons between the way Mark tells this story and the way Matthew tells it. They are substantially identical, but there are significant differences. So I'd like to note those. We start with Mark 8, uh, 31 to 32. Then Jesus began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spoke openly about this. Now Matthew's adjustments are shown there in Greek, in green. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples, uh, emphasized, that he must go to Jerusalem, not mentioned actually in Mark, and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and experts in the law and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Notice that the expression to be rejected is missing, and there's a switch between after three days rise again to on the third day be raised, which fits in more with creedal formula of the early church. A big difference happens in the next column. Looking at Mark, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But after turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. Now, as has happened before in Matthew's gospel, Matthew provides more text for the actors. And so in Matthew's version, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, this must not happen to you. Words not found in Mark's version. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Now that's not found, as you see, in, in uh, Mark's version. And then he goes on to say, because you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. In the third column, Mark reads as follows. Mark 8, 34. And Jesus called the crowd along with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and because of the gospel will save it. For what benefit is it for a person to gain the whole world yet forfeit his life? And what can a person give in exchange for his life? There are some significant omissions this time in Matthew's version. He abbreviates and leaves out some details. Then begins, Jesus said to his disciples, not, not to the crowd who are not part of uh, Matthew's story here. If anyone wants to become a fo my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life because of me will find it. And, and Matthew seems to leave out, and because of the gospel. Partly it's his tendency to abbreviate and partly it's because Jesus is the gospel. There is no distinction. Verse 26 is more or less identical with verses 36 and 37 in Mark. In the final column, there's, you notice, a major shift. So we'll take it paragraph by paragraph. And in Mark uh, 38, we read, For if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. When he comes in the glory of, of his father with the holy angels. Now, Matthew takes out the negative and offers a reassurance instead. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his father, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. And the part in green is in italics because it is a quotation from one of the Psalms. And then Mark concludes in 9.1, and he said to them, I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not experience death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And in Matthew 16.28, we read, I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not experience death before they see the Son of Man 
coming in his kingdom. So profiling the person of Jesus, and it's not so much the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of Jesus. So there are significant adjustments and nuances in Matthew's reception of the Mark and text here, as we can see easily. General remarks. Matthew's text starts with the first passion prediction in Matthew. And the reaction of Peter is especially forceful and dramatic, a kind of action crea, to use that terminology. And a teaching on discipleship opens with a tripartite description to deny himself, to take up his cross, and to follow me. Then follows a structured argument articulated with the conjunction for, for what does it benefit? And the argument takes the form of an opening affirmation, three rhetorical questions, and a closing double affirmation. And we take each section in turn in the commentary. So reading Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So from that time on is Matthew's expression, marking a new development in the teaching of Jesus, specifically about his destiny. And this new development who looks forward as well to the other two passion predictions, the clear ones, in Matthew 17, 22-23, and Matthew 20, 17-19. He begins to show, to indicate, implying Jesus' own consent to the will of God. The little word must uh, in Greek implies here the divine plan behind the suffering and the fulfillment of scripture. It's found in Paul, it's found also in the Synoptic Gospels. There's a, an, an affirmation of this in Matthew 26, 54, which reads, How then would the scriptures that say it must happen this way be fulfilled, that it must happen this way? And then I just notice again that, interestingly, Matthew has omitted Mark's rejected. Uh, it's not that there isn't a division. There will be a tremendous division at the trial of Jesus but he, he is still hopeful for the continuity between Judaism and emerging Christianity. Groups are mentioned. The elders do have a role in the execution of Jesus, as you can see from the various references, as do the chief priests. The experts in the law, the older translation would say the scribes, are also present, but they don't seem to be as significant as the elders and chief priests. It is noticeable that the Romans are not mentioned at all in this passion prediction, the ones who actually did it. And finally, looking forward to the next slide, the must and the necessity of God is taken up by Peter himself in his reaction. So we read Peter's reaction. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, this must not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me because you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. Now, the expression translated here, God forbid, is literally, be merciful to you, hilios. And it implies a longer expression, which really would run something like this. May God be merciful to you in sparing you from having to undergo this destiny. Then translated in a contemporary way as God forbid. Peter's reaction is the natural one of any reader. What place could such suffering have in the planned mind of God? At the same time, Peter does call Jesus Lord in the full sense. Now that expression, be merciful, in Greek contains the word hilios, merciful. And that's related, interestingly, to hilasterion, the mercy seat, or in the temple, the sacrifice of propitiation. The expression, get behind me, is literally, go behind me, is the identical expression for discipleship in the next verse 24. So it's not so much, go away, Peter, but line up properly and learn about discipleship. In that sense, get behind me. 
And we can see that much earlier in the gospel, in the call of the disciples, it says, Jesus said to them, follow me, O Pizumu, and I will turn you into fishers of people, Matthew 4, 19. And in an earlier text in 10, 38, we also read, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me, that is, O Pizumu, come after me, is not worthy of me. So that expression, O Pizumu, after me, is highly significant in Matthew's frame. Satan is by this time the chief demon in, in Jewish faith. He had a sort of evolution from the time of the book of Job, where he's a, properly a member of the heavenly court. Uh, the expression go away is the same word used in Matthew 4.10, go away, Satan. Now, very interesting, the expression stumbling block. That is literally in Greek, scandalon, which means something which makes you stumble. And then our word scandal comes from that, of course. And Matthew is playing with words a good deal here because Peter, who has just been declared a rock, is a stumbling block to Jesus himself. And this idea of a stumbling block is not original to Matthew. It's already found in Paul, where we read in 1 Corinthians 1.23, that we preach about a Christ crucified, a stumbling block, a scandalon to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And in both 1 Corinthians and the Gospels, the context is not understanding the mind of God when it comes to the destiny of Jesus. And in the first letter of Peter, almost certainly not by Peter, the same playing with words continues. There we read, for it says in scripture, look, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. So you also believe, see his value, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock to trip over. And they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So the word play continues in 1 Peter 2, 6 to 8. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now here it's important enough to get the translation right. And a more literal translation would go like this. If anyone would come after me, and there you have the expression, opizu mu. Matthew does not have the words become or the word follower. And I think the literal translation is much less oblique and rather more direct. If anyone wants to come after me. Three descriptions follow, descriptors follow, which don't seem to be aimed expressly at Peter alone, but at any disciple. To deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow me, to come after me. Ironically, deny will be used again of Peter himself in his denial in the Passion story in 2634 following. A comment on the expression, to take up his cross, to take up your cross. It seems to me not clear that the expression to take up your cross goes back to the historical Jesus because it is not a natural metaphor or idiom before the historical crucifixion of Jesus. And it may again come somewhat from the Pauline tradition. Um, to carry his cross is found only here and in the parallels in Mark and Luke. And in the account of Simon of Cyrene in Matthew, and then this only parallel in Mark, um, where the expression is rather literal, where Simon illustrates discipleship by literally carrying the cross after Jesus. Now, that sense of the cross as a, an important metaphor for discipleship is also found in Paul. So in Romans 6, 6, for instance, we read, we know that our old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us, that we would, so we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And in Galatians 2, 19 to 20, a very important passage in Paul, we read, for through the law, I died to the law so that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And the same thought continues in Galatians 5.24. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In later Christian tradition, I have on the left-hand page there, a quotation from the, the letter to the Romans of Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, and he writes, I think rather strangely, I think, for though I am still alive, I am passionately in love with death as I write to you. My passionate love has been crucified and there is no fire of material longing within me, within me but only water living and speaking in me and saying within me, come to a father. Matthew 16, 25. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. This is a general statement of principle and paradox in the Christian life. And in its layout, it shows the balance sort of statement that you find in poetry, kind of biblical parallelism with a sort of inversion. Save, life, lose, followed by lose, life, find ending kind of positively, really. The word for life is psuche, which is literally soul, but here it means oneself, one's true life, one's real or authentic life. And all the fra although the phrase is beautifully balanced the way it's written, the balance is disturbed by the insertion of because of me, that was because of the person of Jesus. This indicates that this is not just any spiritual self-denial that you might find in any decent religion, but for the sake of Jesus and on the model of his destiny. Matthew 16, 26. For what does it profit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his life? Or what can a person give in exchange for his life? And these are two rhetorical questions which start to explore the general principle just announced and invite the participation, engagement of readers and hearers. For the first question, the implied response is nothing. What could have benefited a person to gain the whole world but forfeit your life? And it brings to mind the power of the rich fool in Luke uh, 12, 13 to 21. The second part, 26b, is even sharper. What could possibly be more valuable than life itself? And in Matthew's scheme of things, no one really owns his own life, not a disciple for certain, but also not even the Messiah, whose life is under the a must of the plan of God. And Jesus' fuller teaching of life can be found in the Sermon on the Mount in, the, in this gospel, especially in Matthew 6, 19 to 34. There's an echo in the teaching there of Psalm 48, which is worth noting. A brother does not ransom, shall anyone ransom? He will not give, he will not give to God his atonement and the price for redeeming his soul, for saving his soul. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. To our ears, verse 27 can seem disconnected, but it is another form of reassurance, stroke, motivation. In other words, the argument continues, but no longer in terms of rhetorical questions, but in terms of ultimate outcome. And in Matthew's view, there, there will be an end of time. And Matthew is fond of the vision of the end. It will then be seen that our choices, the ways we use our freedom, really do matter for the ultimate outcome of our lives. You could compare it with the so-called power of the last judgment in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. The part in green in verse 27 is more or less a quotation from Psalm 61 verses 12 and 13 in the Greek translation. Once God spoke, these two things I heard, that might is God's and to you, O Lord, belong mercy, because you will repay to each according to his works. And finally, Matthew 16, 28. 
I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not experience death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Verse 28 really does belong here because it takes the reassurance to another level. In traditional readings, it's often associated with the transfiguration, although the transfiguration takes place six days later, so somewhat remote uh, temporarily from this scene. The expression, I tell you the truth, is literally in Greek, amen, I say to you, so a very solemn beginning. And the promise about not experiencing death before the Son of Man comes in his kingdom adds a note of urgency. That is, the time is now and there's no reason to delay choosing discipleship. And although that sentence in Mark may have indicated imminence, given the time of Matthew's writing, urgency rather than imminence is the key. It also makes a very grand conclusion to a section taking the scene which started near Caesarea Philippi about the destiny of the Son of Man. And it looks forward to the close of this gospel. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, 18. So, Matthew has received, and as we saw, somewhat adjusted a tradition from Mark. Now, each scene is important in its own, and of course, the way they're laid out in sequence is also important. So the Passion Prediction tells us how the story of Jesus' destiny was understood by later generations of Christians. It's under the divine must to be interpreted in the light of the scripture. The Peter scene, verbalized so significantly in Matthew, registers the shock of the Christian proclamation as it includes a horrible death by crucifixion, and it should always be a shock. And finally, the complex tapestry on discipleship has many interwoven threads, the divine plan, the paradox of loss, the existential question of life, the ultimate significance of choices made in the present moment, and the guarantee of future reward. So all in all, a powerful, penetrating text, which cannot fail to speak to us latter-day disciples today. And so Matthew was really asking his readers and us, are you sure you want to be a disciple? A disciple? And he also reminds us that the community of followers is not made up of heroes, glorious heroes, but of cross bearers. And still, it is a call to authentic living, living without illusions. And the reign of God is a paradoxical reality for Matthew, calling not for neat understanding, but for messy engagement. Perhaps these pointers for prayer may help. Number one, short-term loss is sometimes necessary for long-term gain, as a student studying or in athlete training can testify. When have you found that denying yourself proved to be worthwhile because of what you gained afterwards? Number two, Jesus was teaching his disciples that the path of discipleship would involve pain and suffering. Peter would have none of it. When have you found that taking up your cross brought you life, even though at the time it may have been difficult? Number three, Jesus knew that because his good news message was not acceptable to the authorities, he would suffer and die. But God would see that evil would not have the last say. Have you seen a good news message survive even though opponents tried to stifle it? And finally, Jesus promised that those who suffer for the kingdom would be rewarded. Perhaps even in this earthly life, you have experienced this reward. And so we pray. O oh God, whose word burns like a fire within us, grant us a bold and faithful spirit that in your strength we may be unafraid to speak your word and follow where you lead. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, 
who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. I leave you with a famous mosaic of the cross of glory in the church of San Clemente in Rome. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating in this meditation. And as before, I hope it has opened up the reading for you and let it speak to you as a disciple and follower of Jesus today. Thank you very much.